Hi everyone and welcome Margie and um, thank, you for, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to be able to chat with you and to find out who you are and what you do and what's happening with your work in Thailand. So would you like to just tell us a little bit about um, your personal story, who you are, um, how you got to be where you are today? So. Okay, cool. So um, I grew up in Australia and um, always wanted to be a teacher. Um, but really didn't have the brains for it. So when I was graduating you know, um, school, I had to get a minimum of 855 to get into teacher's college. And it went up in increments of five and I got 860. So I just scraped into teacher's college by the skin of my nose. Um, but just loved teaching and always wanted to go and teach overseas. So after I graduated, I taught up here on the Sunshine Coast for seven years. And a job became available in Thailand. I didn't care where I went. I just wanted to go overseas and teach. So I ended up in a city in Thailand called Pattaya. And it has thousands and thousands of prostitutes. It's known for its red light district. And I was teaching in an international school. And someone said, do you want to come to a Bible study? I'm like, no, not really. And they <laughs> said, we have dinner. I said, dinner, dinner's good. I'm in. Let's go. So, um, I went and um, joined them for dinner, and I was always asking the question, why are we born just to die? Whether it's a good life or a bad life, there has to be a point to actually being alive. And I had actually sought um, psychics, numerology, astrology. I'd really been searching. And I went to this Bible study, and I thought, this is the answer. This is... What I, what, this is the answer to all my questions as to why we're, we're born. We're born because we're God's children and where our purpose is to serve him. And then when we die, we go and live with him forever. So that made complete sense to me. So after six weeks, um, I gave my heart to the Lord in a Thai Buddhist nation. So this kind of seems crazy that you would come from a Christian country to a Thai Buddhist country to get saved and meet Jesus. Well, God's like that, though, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so you found Jesus in Thailand. Yeah. Uh, and you're still in Thailand now, which is how many, many years later? 22 Why years. Why are you still in Thailand and what are you doing? So, um, well, when I got saved, I was got, actually got saved in a little tiny Baptist church. It was fantastic. And they said, you're a teacher, so can you go teach the kids Sunday school? I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, but I don't know anything about the Bible. And um, they said, oh, well, we've got a curriculum. So I said, okay, we've got a curriculum. I can, I can teach curriculum. And I'd go and teach the kids. And the kids are like, I've got a question. I'm like, I have no idea. So I tell you what, you go ask your mom and dad. And I'll ask the pastor. And we'll talk about it next week, okay? So I was learning with the kids and growing with them. And I had been a Christian for just six weeks. And it was Children's Day. We have Mother's Day, Father's Day, and Children's Day. And so someone said, oh, this." Uh, the police asked if someone could come and do children's activities outside the police station. And the church said, well, you're the craziest person. We know you go. So I went <laughs> and just did some clowning around and gave out some lollies and stuff. And, um, and at the end, one of the policemen said, oh, there's children upstairs in the jail. And so I asked him, can I go and see the children? And he said, yes. And I'll never forget the day I walked into that jail. I met a little boy, his name was Tang, and he was eight years old and he came from Cambodia. And all I had was lollies and I promised him the next day I'd come back with chicken and rice. He says, you come, Missy, you come, you promise you come. I said, I will come, Tang, I promise I come. And then out pops his three-year-old sister that he's looking after all by himself, he's eight years old. And then he starts to cry and he says, I so sorry, I cry, Missy. I so sorry, I cry. No food here, no food in Cambodia, no food anywhere. So I walked out and I knew that I knew that I had to go back. So that started the prison ministry. Um, and I was with the church for 13 years um, and they ran an orphanage. And, you know, we need orphanages. I'm not saying close down orphanages, but whilst I was there, three key events happened. Number one, a little girl dying of leukemia. And I said, make a wish, anything you want, I'll make it happen. And she said, I want my mom and dad. 
And then a little boy kept running away from the orphanage to his auntie who lived in the slum. I said, can't we help the auntie take care of the, the, the boy? And they said, no, we don't have those resources. And that's true. And then I saw parents bring their children to the orphanage and leave crying. And I'd say, why? If you love your kid, why do you do this? And so the top three answers were, I don't have enough money to send my child to school. I don't have enough money for food and I don't have housing. But if I put my child in the orphanage, they get everything they need for free. My child is better off without me. And I would say, no, 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 no. Your child needs family. So I began to look for who keeps families together. And uh, I couldn't find anyone. And then the verse kept on coming up. I was hungry and you fed me, naked and you clothed me, in prison and you visited me. When, Lord, did we see you like this? Whenever you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. So I'd open my Bible, it was there. I'd look at a poster, it's there. I'd open the daily bread, it's there. Um, I'd go to church and someone's preaching on it. Um, and I just had this desire to leave everything that I was doing. I mean, I was very active in the church. I was on the church board, the orphanage board. I was running all the kids' activities on Saturdays and Sundays. And God said, leave. And I thought, nah, this can't possibly be God. I love everything I do. These people need me. And God's like, if you want the best, you have to lay this down. And it was like laying all of my hopes and dreams on the altar of sacrifice because I loved what I did. And I said, okay, God, if you give me a supernatural confirmation, I will leave everything, not knowing what I would do. So I go into the prison this one day and this lady, she says, I want to be Christian. I said, really? Why? She said, because every day I sit here and Jesus, he gave me water, but Buddha, he never came. Jesus, he gave me food, but Buddha, he never came. Jesus, he gave me clothes, but Buddha, he never came. Jesus, he came to visit me, but Buddha, he never came. I thought, wow, you've never read the Bible. You have no idea what God's been talking to me about. So in January 2009, um, I kind of left everything that I knew and I didn't know what I was doing. All I knew I was going to keep going to the prison. So I rented a small shed and I would make sandwiches at night time, go to the international school, teach all day, on the way home from school, go to the prison, feed the kids, make more sandwiches. And these kids started showing up. You hungry? Yeah. You want a sandwich? Yeah. You want some clothes? Yeah. Want to play a game? Yeah. So within two weeks, I had kids club going. And then I said, okay, God, you never send anyone out one by one. Where's my two by two? So he brought me an ex-drug addict, an ex-prostitute, an ex-alcoholic, and me. And um, we called it hand to hand because it was our hand extended to the poor and God's hand on top of ours like that. So still no concept that I would ever give up my job, that it would become a big foundation. There was never any plans to do that. Um, so the grandmas started to come and by eight months down the track, we had up to 60 kids showing up every night and on Saturdays at the kids club. So these two ladies that I had known for quite a while, um, they came to visit me. And um, when Pai, who's now the president of our foundation, got to the door of my center, she burst out crying. And I said, what? She said, I was praying this afternoon. I put my hand out like this. And I said, God, you have to answer me. And God put his hand on top of mine like that and said, I'll lead you to a place where my hand is upon you. So that was our logo. And that's what it meant. So I said, okay, come on inside. Anything you want to do, what's in your heart of hearts? So what would you do if you didn't have to worry about money, time, resources, or education? Now, understanding these two ladies, one of them's only finished grade four and one's only finished grade nine. Wow. She said, I want to teach the poor kids. I'm not a teacher, but I want to teach the poor kids. I said, okay, well, I have a room. I have no desks. I have no chairs. I have no books. I have recycled 
paper and crayons and toys from the school that I'm working at, uh, you can teach the kids here. So the next week we opened up a free preschool for kids in the slum with no sponsors, no money and no resources. <laughs> wow. And pe people are just laughing. They're like, this is never going to work. You don't have this. You don't. I said, okay, I know what I don't have, but can I tell you what I do have? I love God and I love people and nothing else matters. So people began to give us secondhand tables, secondhand chairs. We realized that um, educating these preschool kids and sending them home hungry wasn't really helping. So we began to go into the slums to feed their families. So slum ministry started. So I'm still teaching for in full time at the international school. We've got kids club going. I'm doing prison on the way home from school. We've got preschool. And now we're going into the slums and feeding families. And whilst we're in there, we saw these um, older kids not going to school. Why don't you go to school? Don't have enough money. So scholarship started. Um, so then we started to send kids to school. Um, and then one of our kids got sick. So we went to the local hospital to visit our sick kid. And the nurse says, oh, you you help poor people. Can you pay this hospital bill of this Cambodian boy? And the, the little boy, he had no sucking reflex. So he had to be nasal gastric fed. And um, we said, no, we don't have any money, but um, we have Jesus. So we laid our hands on the baby and God healed the baby right there in the nurse's arm. Wow. And she's like, okay, who are you? And when are you coming back? <laughs> <laughs> so hospital ministry started. So it's getting quite big now. We've been doing this for just over a year. Um, and I thought, well, we need to become a foundation, then I can quit my job because then I can get work permits. So the timeline was two to five years for a foundation to be approved. But our foundation was approved in two months. Oh, wow. And, uh, but then our next problem was you need half a million baht to open your foundation. Well, you know, we've got a few sponsors, but we don't have any sponsors that big. And um, around about the same time, I actually came home and um, I, my biggest prayer was, I want a sending church. And I never told anybody that, you know, I was in these Christian mission meetings where people were saying, my home church is praying, my home church is praying. I'm like, I don't have a home church. I got saved on the mission field. I don't have anywhere that I can, you know, call and hold on to. And I was sitting in church and at the NBC and my last weekend before I was going back to Thailand, George Rankin pulled me out the front and he said, we're going to send Margie as a missionary out from this church. And I never told anyone that was my heart's desire. And so God cool. knew that. I didn't know how, that's ha how that happened. So that, for those of you that don't know, that's our church that we're at now. Yeah. So that was, that was pretty amazing. So, um, we had the papers done. We needed half a million baht. So I met this guy in the street and he says, um, what do you need? I said, I need half a million baht. He said, there you go. And he gave us a half a million baht to open up a foundation. How much is that so, in Australia? Completely God, completely God. So now we have a free preschool for up to 40 kids. We feed 80 families in the slums. We have over 100 kids on scholarship from grade one all the way through to university. Several of our students have graduated. They now work for Bosch, for big companies, because we help them to get jobs when they graduate. Uh, we go to the hospital once a week. We're going to the prisons twice a week. We have a Saturday kids club. Uh, we now have a, a football club. And I mean, God even cares about football. Like I got this email two years ago and it said, we're having this fun day at this international school and we're also playing soccer. Do you want to come? Sure. So I took 32 kids to this fun day. Well, it was a soccer tournament between international schools. So my kids were in flip flops, tracksuit pants, no idea how to play soccer. We lost every game. And um, at the end of the day, people were like, who are these kids that are losing every game but having the best time? Mm -hmm. 
And I said, oh, we're hand to hand. So by the end of the day, we had our own coach. Within two months, we had a sponsor. We had uniforms. We went back to the same international school tournament two years later and picked up the trophy. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> so God even cares about soccer. So we got a soccer club. Um, and then when we go to the slums to feed people, we were praying for people. And it was just taking us so long. So we said, here's the deal. When we come to give you food on Friday, we're going to pray for you. But if you've got like real prayer needs, we're just going to come to the slum on a Tuesday and a Thursday night and come and we'll pray for you. So we had no concept of what it would turn into. So we showed up in the slums. We put blue plastic chairs underneath the stars, no building, no trained pastor, no one who could play a musical instrument, just me on my tambourine. <laughs> and we would press play on a, a CD and we would worship God and people would come. And people healed of alcoholism. Somebody healed of leukemia, healed of drug addiction. Like God was just healing these people in the slums. So they kept on coming. So now we have a church um, with over 80 baptized believers from the slum. We still don't have anyone who's been to Bible school. Um, a worship team is made up of people who've picked up a guitar and learned um, how to play from YouTube. Uh, but the, the joy of the Lord is there. We've got a little old lady who can't read or write leading cell groups in the slum. So she goes to church. She knows what Pi is preaching about. Um, and then during the middle of the week, someone who can read, she says, this is the verse. He looks it up. He reads it. And they talk about it. So, you know, we've got little old lady, illiterate little old ladies leading cell groups in the slum. So we've now got a church. <laughs> um, and, you know, all of this is impossible without God. And none of this was really planned. And about four and a half years ago, God said to me, Margie, how much do you trust me? I said, 100%, God. He said, okay, sell your house, sell your car, sell everything you own and give it to me. So I did. And um, I had 4.5 million baht. And so that's about 100, about almost $200,000. So I went looking for a place to buy that would house our preschool. And I found this 12 million baht building. And God said, that's your building. I said, God, I don't have enough money for that building. He said, that's your building. So I called the guy who owned it. And whilst I was calling him, someone else sent me an email and said, I'll give you half a million baht towards that building you're looking at. So I went to the owner of the building. And I said, please, sir, uh, I know you want 12 million, but I only have 5 million. And he said, go and raise me another half a million baht and I'll give it to you for 5.5. So the problem was that the building didn't have a building permit. So we had to get plans redrawn. The guy wanted 150,000 baht for the plans. We said we didn't have that much money. So he did it for 5,000 baht. <laughs> wow. Um, and we got the building for 5.5 million. Now, two years prior to that, a company who was building a um, plastics factory said, we want to donate to you all of the offices and cafeteria areas because whilst the plastics factory was being built this was the office and where people ate once it was operational everything on site had to be explosion proof so it was basically this metal meccano kind of building with tiles and windows and air conditioners and doors and they said we will pull it all down we will transport it we will rebuild it anywhere you want for free and i could have raised up enough money to buy a piece of land to put it on and god said that's not yours give it away so we gave away this building to an aids home um and people were just calling me crazy like margie you're absolutely crazy sell it i said no i'm not selling it god said give it away but when it was our turn god gave us building right in the middle of the city 
so I'd sold my car as well. And uh, so a friend was leaving Thailand and she gave me her beautiful sports rider. And God said, that's not your car, give it away. And so I said to her, I said, look, you know, God's she said, it's your car, do whatever you want. So I gave this beautiful four wheel drive sports rider to a missionary family. Um, and then that, I get a phone call from this guy and um, he asks me what I need. And I said, I need a truck. And he says, that's great. What, what kind of truck do you want? I said, any good secondhand truck would be good. He said, I'm not buying garbage. So he picked us up, took us down to the Nissan showroom and um, we bought a brand new Nissan Navara leather seats, rear view camera off the showroom floor. <laughs> So we learned very quickly, if it's not yours, give it away. So we got our preschool building. And then two and a half years ago, I got an email from the USA. What would you do if we gave you a quarter of a million US dollars? I thought, I don't know these people, that's spam. So um, they're like, no, we're serious. What would you do with a quarter of a million dollars? Um, I buy land and build houses. So they said, we love your idea, um, but here's the deal. We're gonna give you 100,000 and you've got a a three months to raise another 150,000 US dollars. Now, part of me didn't want the money because I didn't want another project to run. So I think I was the only missionary on the planet praying against finances. God, please do <laughs> not let this money come. <laughs> but I will do whatever you put before me. So I set up a GoFundMe page. I got $70 and I'm like, hallelujah, praise the Lord. The money's not coming. I don't have to do this project. <laughs> and um, we opened up the account one morning, 50,000 US dollars anonymously donated to the account. Someone calls me from Hong Kong, never met this person, still never met them, sends a 25,000 US dollars. And the money just poured in. So we ended up um, getting the money. And now we have 1,600 square meters. We have housing for the poor. Um, we also have a child protection room there where children who are rescued from child trafficking rings, the police can bring them there. They can interview them one by one. Uh, there's places to play. There's things to eat. If we need to keep them for a couple of nights, we can put them into the homes of the other people who are living there. Um, so now we've kind of got a, a child um, protection center there as well. We built a kitchen. So we're training people how to um, cook so that they can create an income. And then someone said, do you want 150 wooden pallets? Sure. I have no idea what I'm going to do with them, but yeah, yeah, I want them. So we got them, we pulled them apart and we started hammering pieces of wood together to make some simple stools because we needed more seats. And Bosch got a hold of what we were doing. So they sent us 15,000 euros worth of Bosch power tools, plus engineers to come down and teach us how to use them. And so now we make furniture. So last year we went solar because of the Irish embassy. Um, and right now I'm in the middle of writing up another um, grant project because we want to start growing enough food that will provide the ingredients that we need to run the cooking school and set people up into micro enterprise so that they can start cooking and feeding their own families. So we actually haven't got a clue what we're doing. No one in our team is qualified for this. <laughs> I, I'm, oh, I'm a teacher and I'm the most highly qualified person in our entire organization. <laughs> but, you know, God's brought us trained accountants, you know, that are working for us for free. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. So um, with this coronavirus, it's been really interesting over in Thailand because, um, you know, over here, there's been shortages of toilet paper and all that kind of stuff. Well, in Thailand, you can walk in and you can buy anything you want because no one's got any money to buy it. Mm. 
the only people who are in the stores are the people who are buying food to give to the poor. So, you know, the, the lines for food go for kilometers. And like people start lining up for food at 4.30 in the morning for food that's given out at 11.30 in the afternoon. So um, we're now feeding thousands and thousands of people. Um, but again, you know what? You, you can't just keep feeding people for forever. So in Thailand, you're not allowed out onto the, um, the street unless you have a mask or you can be arrested. So if you don't have a mask, you can't even line up for food. So we now employ 12 people who are making masks out of fabric. And each person gets two masks and a cake of soap. We're providing employment for 12 people. Um, we're also employing people to help us cook the thousands of meals that we're giving out every week. So again, we're providing employment there. Um, and we ran out of money for these projects at the end of April. No, sorry, at the end of May. And the last week in May, Red Bull contacted me and they're funding the projects for the next three months. So wow. God is That's so huge. good. So good. I mean, every day, every day, there's a miracle. And, you know, God has never failed us. You know, there was an organization in Pattaya that they were fighting with everyone. And they were working with children. And God said, call them and tell them they can come to your center and take anything they want to help them out. So I called them up and um, they came around. They didn't even have a truck. So we said, you can load our truck and borrow our truck. And I managed to collect this little box of Lego. I mean, my kids love Lego and you know how expensive that stuff is. So every expat that had left Thailand and donated a piece of Lego, it went into this box. And it had taken me like eight years to build up this one box of Lego. And they went, Lego, can we have the Lego? And my head's going, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. My heart's going, give them anything they want. So I said, yes, you can have my Lego. They weren't even turning the corner. And Bosch calls me and says, we've just had a conference for our engineers in Bangkok. And the get to know you activity was build something in your groups together with Lego. And we have 20 massive boxes of Lego. <laughs> Would you like it? <laughs> that is so cool. That's the best story. I mean, he just, he cares about everything from how am I going to feed my kids to my kids playing football to Lego, you know? Um, you know, in, the prisons have been amazing. I mean, we've seen so many people come to the Lord there. Um, we've literally, you know, this one day we walked in and there was this um, very, very sick Cambodian lady lying on the floor. and um, I said to the guard, can we take her to the hospital? And he said, no. And I, I, I knew he was going to say that. So all I could say to her in Khmer was, Salanet, which is God loves you. That's it. That is my extent of Khmer. And um, I just held her head in my lap and I was just stroking her hair saying, Salanet, God loves you. God loves you. And she lifts her hands and she says, Jesus, 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 Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, three times, and she dies right there in my arms. <gasps> and God said to me, the gospel is so simple. I didn't preach a sermon. I didn't have a worship team. She didn't pray a prayer of salvation. I said, God loves you. She called on the name of the Lord and went to heaven. I mean, it is that simple, really. Um, so, and then I, I went out to tell the guards that, you know, grandma had just died. And um, I came back in and I mean, I had like 60 screaming, wailing Cambodians who were terrified that this, well, number one, they were angry that this grandma had died on the prison floor. 
Number two, they were full of grief. And number three, they were terrified of her spirit who was now trapped, right? And um, so I just told them about the gospel and I prayed for them and every single Cambodian gave their heart to the Lord. Wow. I mean, we've prayed for prison guards who've been healed. I mean, there was one lady and she was in the jail and she was convulsing like this, right? And they said, oh, we need medicine for her. I said, well, I don't have any medicine, but I have Jesus. So I prayed for her. I left. I came back the next day and they're like, Jesus is here. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not Jesus. I'm like, I just remember that, <laughs> that got eaten by worms because he let people bow down to them, right? So I said, no, 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 I'm not Jesus. And um, She'd been healed. So she gets out of jail and a couple of months later, um, I turn up to the jail and here she is sitting outside and she said, I told my friend that when I was in jail that you prayed for me and Jesus healed me, but she won't believe it's true. Tell her it's true. So I told her it was true. So the lady said, okay, I know this old man in the slum and uh, he can't walk. Will God heal him? I said, yes. She said, will you pray for him? I said, yes. She said, when? I said, let's go right now. So I loaded them in my car. We stopped off and got some rice, went and visited this old man, prayed for him. Do you feel any better? No. Nope. Can you move your legs? No. Nope. Like, do you feel any change? No. Nope. And God's like, you're done. So I left the slum and just went home to my prayer closet and God just said, just keep interceding, just keep interceding. So that was on the Thursday. On the Sunday, this guy from the slum walks into a five-star hotel, which that took guts to start with, where our church was being held. He walked 10 kilometers from the slum to the church to tell us he'd been healed. So several years later, I'm walking past this construction site, and I hear, I'm like, oh. So this guy comes running up and he said, you remember me? I'm like, nope. He says, I'm the guy that got healed. I said, oh, okay. So he said, wait, wait, wait. So he runs off and he comes back and he still had the Bible that I'd given him. And he hadn't connected to a church, but listen to what he did every lunchtime. He said, every lunchtime, I don't eat any lunch. So effectively, he was, a fat, he was fasting every lunchtime. I don't eat, and I just read from this book. And everybody listens, and many people believe about Jesus. <laughs> he said, it's falling apart. Can I have another one? I said, you meet me here tomorrow, I'll bring a Thai pastor, and I'll bring a box of Bible. I mean, God is just using the most simple person, the old lady who can't read and write, you know, this guy who doesn't even know he's fasting every lunchtime. He's not thinking about it in those terms. He's leading these people to the Lord. I mean, we've led hell's angels to the Lord. I mean, I led a hell's angels to the Lord. And after he prayed, his phone went. And it was his buddies. And they said, you're going to miss out on um, happy hour. And um, he said, I'm not coming to the bar tonight. I'm going home. And he hung up and he went home. <laughs> I mean, it's just got um, our volunteers, you know, they've come to the Lord. We've got a 72 year old man. And he's just so in love with Jesus, had a really hard life. He's an expat. So it's not even just the ties. It's not even just the poor. It's, you know, one lady came and she was very wealthy. And she said, I love this place. I want to be here. And I said, Michelle, when you're sober, you can come anytime you want. So God set her free of alcoholism because she wanted to come to hand to hand. And so it's just so amazing seeing what, what God does mm. in so many different areas. So. Yeah, that's so huge. So um, you've touched a little bit on what's happening now with COVID, but um, what's happening? Okay, you're here. You're in Australia. Yeah. 
Um, what's happening with the, like, who's looking after things over there? Is the school still running? Um, the preschool still running? What's happening in that side of things over there at the moment? So um, all the schools are closed. That means we're closed as well. Um, we're not allowed to go into the prisons right now, which is really hard. Um, our hospital ministry is still because we're not allowed to go into the ward, but we're providing the hospitals with these handmade masks and milk for the children and all that kind of stuff. So what we're really focusing right now on is feeding the people. But I was actually in the U.S. on a big fundraising trip. So I left Thailand on the 28th of January, and I was supposed to land back in Thailand on the 4th of April. But COVID happened. I couldn't get back into Thailand. I ended up coming back to Australia and got quarantined um, in the beautiful Ridges Hotel overlooking the Brisbane River. <laughs> I mean, it was an amazing place. I mean, I, I have no complaints. Um, I was quarantined for 14 days and now I'm describe myself as happily stuck. I can't leave Australia. So um, what I'm doing is I'm meeting with my team um, every two or three days, we're spending about 20 hours a week on Zoom. Um, and I'm leading my leadership team from this side of the ocean. And what's happening is these Thai national leaders are rising up into things, doing things that they would never dream that they were doing. And so although all of me just wants to be there on the streets with them, giving out the food, praying for people, doing the stuff, God's like, I got you exactly where I want you because if you were in Thailand, I couldn't grow your leadership like I am now. So, um, you know, I, I'm not going to say it's not been without its struggles, but what God is doing is just incredible. And when you consider my board is made up of one person who's finished grade nine, two people who finished grade four, <laughs> and the other person has probably finished grade three, and me, and we're running this foundation. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, we're talking finances, we're talking government reports. I mean, it's crazy. That's God. That's God, though, isn't it? Like he's bigger than all that stuff. So, and and that's and that's the thing. When even non Christians come, they go, you know what? There has to be a higher being taking care of this place because it is impossible in 10 years we've grown from we don't even have a table and a chair to owning the preschool building owning houses running eight different areas of ministry you know our first year of um budget it cost us 168,000 baht 10 years later our yearly budget is four and a half million baht wow Wow, yeah. <laughs> you can't even like, if you can get your brain around that. It's huge. I know. Wow. So. Yeah, wow, that's, that's really great. Thank you for sharing that, all that with us. Um, have you got anything, before I open it up to questions, which I'll do in a minute, is there anything that you want to you say to us as women around the world who can pray for you, who can um, share your stories? Is there anything you would like to say to us before we open it up to questions? Yeah, you know, I just really feel like, you know, even if you're not equipped, just go out and do something, you know. And um, if the least, I'd say our greatest asset is we don't know what we're doing, right? So when God says go left, we go left. When God says go right, we go right because we don't know what it's supposed to look like. We don't have any contingency plans. Um, and so I'm just really excited for, you know, our whole ministry is run by women. That's and you know, none of us set out to do any of this. It was just looking after the one person that God brought before us each day, each day, each day. And so, yeah, I just, I'm really excited about that. Mm, so good. Okay. Does anyone want to ask Margie any questions, anything at all you like, whether it's about the foundation, herself, her story, um, just unmute yourself or I'll unmute you um, and ask away. Maggie, how do you hear God's voice so specifically and so clearly? Um, I'm a very visual learner. 
Um, and so God speaks to me a lot through um, circumstances or like, for example, one of the most um, memorable ones is I had a very angry alcoholic father demanding his child and I was, he was drunk and I was going to put the child in the back of a motorbike. And I said to him, look, if you don't leave, I'm going to call one of these policemen. And I had all these policemen's name cards and the guy ran. And then in my prayer closet that night, God said to me, he said, you saw how fast that man ran at the name of the policeman. You have no idea how fast the devil runs at the sound of my name. So every night time I call the name of Jesus, I have this mental picture. So, um, you know, like when opening up the foundation, um, you know, leaving the church and Stepping out into what? I didn't even know what I was going to do. I mean, I, I'm just blatant. I say to God, God, give me a confirmation. Show me something supernatural. And when that lady said, you know, I want to be a Christian and quoted the scripture. Um, so I just find I get this, I get this feeling, this knowing when I'm praying and it doesn't go away. And mm. even if it doesn't make sense, there's an inner peace about it. And then there will be a confirmation. So do you wait, you wait for that confirmation? It just seems like you hear actual words that, you know, God would say to you, sell that, don't sell that, that's yours, that's not yours. So when they, yeah, so like let's take that, the building, for example. So when they, they offered us the building, the first thing I did is went looking for land, right? And whilst we're looking for land, I'm going, no, no, this, this, this is not right. We need to give this away. Yeah. And so then I prayed into it and, um, you know, I could have made it happen. Yeah. And God's like, do you want good or do you want the best? Yeah. And so, and then, you know, then I was like praying. It's like, okay, God, who am I supposed to give this to? And I'm not afraid to put a fleece out to God. And I'm not afraid to say to God, I'm confused. I don't understand this. I don't get this. God, I need someone to come and give me a confirmation. Um, and with leadership, it's myself and a Thai person at the top of the leadership tree. And if, if we don't agree on something, we won't move until we have peace about an agreement. So we won't give in to each other um, because if we, if we don't agree, then it's not God. And it might not be, it's not God for this time. And later on, it will be the time. So I wouldn't say I hear God's voice audibly, um, but I do get that inside my head. I do almost hear a voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Raylan. That was a great question. Mm. Anyone else got anything they'd like to ask Margie? Yep, Liz. You need to, oh, hang on. I've got to unmute you. Wait, 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 wait. Hang on. There we go. There we go. Um, I'm fascinated by all this. It's just been um, such a delight to listen to you. One, one of my questions is um, when these people come to know Christ that are living in the slums, do their circumstances change for the better? Do they leave? The slums do they stay there um, and minister like is there that pro progression from you know being in the slums coming to know Christ and sort of moving out of there or or is it all still the same you know um, so it's, um, it's very different for different cases so for example we've had um, one girl and um, she led her family to the Lord um, and she's also was one of our scholarship students. She graduated from university and now, yes, they have left the slum. But say, for example, this illiterate old lady, she's, you know, she's too old to work. She's illiterate. She's never going to get a job. Um, but God has placed her in the slum as a leader. So they actually become leaders of their community. Um, mm -hmm. So sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Like, for example, some of the people from the slums now live in our new housing estate. And what we found is that during this coronavirus, that the people that are on our regular support for slum ministry food, um, 
they have now become the rich people. And so homeless people are coming to them and going, where do you get this food from? And they start to tell them about hand to hand. And now they start to tell them about Jesus. So I wouldn't say it's an instant overnight fix. Um, but I do definitely see God's provision come. So it might be provision, like one old couple, they had no family and we were supporting them. And we just began to pray that we would find their family. And within six months, we found the daughter and the daughter came and said, I've been looking for my father for years and years and years. And now the old couple live with the daughter. So Yes, their, their situation definitely does change. I wouldn't say that it always means that they move out of the slum because especially if they've lived there for a long time, that is their community um, and that becomes their mission field. Um, but definitely their mm. circumstances improve, yes. Terrific. Thank you. Anyone else got anything they'd like to ask Margie? No, we're... no, awesome. Oh, right. you do you have an oh, do, you, do you have an interpreter? You say you don't speak much of the language. Do you have someone interpret wherever you go, or do people there like, speak English? Yeah, in in terms of you know street level, going to the slums, talking to people in the slums, my tie like that is perfect. Um, Walking into a business meeting, it's a little bit different. So that's another gift that God's given me of time is that I'm studying Thai now. So, you know, I started at course one. I worked through four courses in four days because I'm just putting the connecting bits together. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm using this time really to really get stuck into study and become more fluent in the language. But, yes we do have interpreters that come with us because a lot of our volunteers don't speak Thai either, so. And where are you living now if you sold your house? I see you're in a house. Oh yeah, this is my mum and dad's house. So I'm in Australia um, yeah. and so I'm living with mum and dad right now. Um, and you know, in Thailand, I was living um, in this, this house <laughs> and um, Honestly, I'm never home, so I don't care where I live. Just give me somewhere that's got a bed and, you know, somewhere where I can shower. So I was um, living in this house and this, this um, guy came over and he was visiting hand to hand and just seeing what it was like. And um, I said to him, I said, look, I've just got to pop into my house and pick up some stuff. Do you mind? And he said, no problem. So I said, well, come on in and get a drink of water. Now, I was living in this house that had concrete pillars in the middle and they were cracks they were twisted cracks and there was massive gaps between the wall and the floor and these giant mutant cockroaches would crawl up underneath so I had newspapers stuffed down there so that the cockroaches couldn't crawl up and I, I came back downstairs and he was just this look on his face and he's like why do you live here I said, it's my house. What, what do you mean by I live here? I live here. He said, this is not okay. He said, this is not okay for God's missionary to be living in squalor like this. And I'm like, I don't care. So anyway, he said to me, so what's your dream house? I said, it would be a two bedroom place, very small, I don't need a big space, but inside a community that has a community swimming pool, that's big enough that I could do laps. So he said, go find me a place like that and I'll pay you rent. <laughs> so, you know, when I sold my house and everything, God, he said to me, he said, I promise I'll never leave you hungry. I'll never leave you homeless. I'll never leave you naked. I'll never leave you alone. And he has been so, so, so faithful. I mean, I've been down to well, I guess I'm fasting for the rest of the month because I got no money left. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to ask anyone for anything. And, um, and then I wake up the next morning and God says, uh, go check your bank account. You just got this unction. I need to go put, and I put in this almost a thousand dollars donated by someone in America, just popped it into my account. <laughs> 
Wow. So, so grateful. My, my biggest financial miracle was probably one of the first ones was um, I went to the Philippines and uh, the, I was teaching these people how to set up a Sunday school program. It was a very poor church. So, um, I mean, obviously they had nothing, no scissors, paper, glue. So I said, come on, let's go buy you everything that you need. So, I mean, I just went to the ATM and I'm just pulling out money, 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 money. I get back to Thailand. I'm like, oh, drained my entire account. I mean, I really am not good with figures, right? So, um, I didn't even have enough money to buy fuel to drive to and from work for the rest of the month. So, I pulled all the money out of my purse and I counted it out and I wrote it down how many 10 bahts I had, how many 20 bahts, da, da, da. And I really felt like God saying, Will you trust me that I will take care of you? Yes, God. So I put it all in my purse and I thought, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to think about it. So I went to church. I paid my tithes. I went to the store. I bought food. I paid for fuel. And all of a sudden, it was the end of the month. And I thought, I didn't run out of money. And I opened up my purse and I swear to you that I still had exactly the same amount of money in exactly the same denominations as when I came back to the Philippines. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> oh my, that's, yeah, that kind of does your head in, doesn't it? <laughs> wow. You know, when I became a Christian and I, you know, I don't advocate this to everyone and, you know, I really feel like it very early in my walk, God, you know, put a, a, a test out there. And when I heard that you had to tithe, I was so shocked that I never knew about this tithing thing. So I went back to as much as I could remember, even when I was a high school kid working at Kmart. And I worked out my tithe on the lot and tithed everything that I could remember before I was 30. Wow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I'm not, yeah, it's just, you know, God has just blessed me financially. He's kind of, he's, he's really been one of those things that he's led me right from the very beginning of my walk with him, you know? Mm. Mm. So good. So yeah, good. he's so faithful. So good. Anyone else got anything they want to ask before we finish up? Okay. Um, uh, can, I come, yeah. can I come in? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is not actually a question, uh, but uh, really uh, we are inspired by Sister Maggie Grainger, uh, her testimony. And her services, uh, it has been a great motivation for me. A uh, true leader, a true disciple of God. How uh, uh, from, from slum ministry she has started without any money, but having faith in God. God has, you know, he's Jehovah Jireh. If you want to do something, just move ahead, pray, and definitely God will open the doors. And uh, feeding so many families during COVID-19 in Thailand. That was really a great miracle, mm -hmm. even though she didn't have money and uh, she has, uh, you know, uh, helped so many people uh, to gain employment and uh, providing uh, masks and uh, pro feeding so many pe people, providing employment. <laughs> One person uh, can do so many things. It's really, it's, it's just a miracle. And only with God's help, uh, God has been uh, gracious and uh, sister is a great inspiration for us and uh, she has made uh, so many people walk in the uh, ways of Lord and many people have been saved and uh, not only that uh, from uh, even though yeah, the youth were uneducated she was able to uh, from YouTube they were able to uh, learn the songs how to play music and uh, they are doing worship now so many things uh, one person so uh, today is really a special day for me and uh, sister uh, Maggie, we, you are a great inspiration for us. Thank you so much. We are truly uh, blessed and we are uh, truly power filled. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. That was awesome. Yeah. And Joining my what... to encourage people to just go out and do something, anything, you know. Yeah. The gospel is so simple and, you know, just do something. Yeah. So, yeah, Thank joining you. while I want to share, you know, this verse came to my mind. Uh, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. You know, the seed, what God has planted in your heart, it has become a blessing, uh, like a big tree, grown, to, grown into a big tree and has become a blessing to Thai people. Uh, it's really an inspiration for us and it's a learning experience. Thank you for sharing your story, your testimony. It's really amazing how God, uh, you know, works through people and uh, God has really been using you okay. for you. the expansion of his uh, kingdom, mm -hmm. you know, to share his love, his compassion for the humankind. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, yeah. for uh, giving us, uh, you know, this opportunity. Oh, that's, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. I love it when you guys are here. It's so good. So good. All right. Well, we, we're going to um, just close off and by praying for Margie. Um, and, um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know what we're doing next week. We've got our conference coming up in two weeks' time. So um, I'm not sure whether we'll have any more of these before that. We'll just see how we go with our time because it's a lot of we're doing a lot of stuff to get that up and running it's really exciting though so if you didn't know about that we're having an online conference in two weeks awesome um, yes yes it's gonna be exciting um yes. information's on our facebook page but um daisy i know you i think you've registered so you'll get an email about that as well so um all right so we're just going to pray for margie and then we'll close off lord we want to thank you um for margie lord and thank you that she was willing and able to come and share with us today. Lord, thank you for the incredible life you've given her. Lord, for the incredible things um, you've done that she's seen, that she's able to share with us, Lord. Lord, thank you for the, um, the people in Thailand that she works with, Lord, for those that you've, you've put around her, Lord, to help her run the foundation. And Lord, we know that nothing, none of this would have happened without you. Lord, I pray that um, as she's here in Australia, Lord, that... Um, you will keep the connection with Thailand strong, Lord, that even though they're working without her, Lord, that they will um, know that she's just available on the other end of the Zoom call. Lord, I pray that um, that they will continue to grow and, Lord, that you'll continue to reach more people through their ministry, even during this time of COVID, Lord, while we're, while we're feeding, Lord, even though they haven't got their preschool running. Lord, I pray that, that um, as COVID comes to an end, Lord, that Muggy will be able to go back, Lord, and that you'll continue to grow and strengthen that ministry, Lord, and um, more people will be reached for you with, with your word. And we thank you, Lord, for her. Lord, I pray that you'll keep her well and healthy, Lord, as she um, travels back to Thailand sometime in the future, Lord, that um, it will be an amazing time. And, Lord, when they meet again, Lord, that that will be an amazing time. Lord, we thank you for who you are and for your great love and for your miracles. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Thank everybody. Bye-bye. No Bye. worries. We'll see you Bye. soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye.